So welcome everybody again to our, um, oh, I don't know what installment this is of the GAR Hall Special Events Zoom Edition. And um, I want to thank everybody who has been so faithful and following us like every other week with the um, presentations we've had. We've had some fabulous presenters and you guys are really great. Um, we don't charge anything for these presentations. The Historical Society um, just wanted to offer this to the community to keep everyone engaged while we were all in lockdown. So I want to let you know I've got two more programs scheduled couple tentatively scheduled because we're just not sure what's going to happen. But in June, we've got John Forte, the heirloom gardener, who's going to come in and he's going to talk about heirloom plants and gardening in your yard. And that's in, um, we're doing that in conjunction with the uh, Situate Garden Club. So um, they are, are hosting it with us as well. And for anyone who doesn't know, this Saturday at the Man House Farm, which is actually a historical society um, site, the Garden Club will having their annual plant sale that they work on all year long. Um, their members, you know, have planted things there. I guess to this year is dahlias is the big um, focus, but you can get everything from vegetables, plants, perennials, annuals. It's a wonderful. It's I believe nine to one maybe maybe somebody um one of the trustees might know if that time is different but anyways that's at the man house on greenfield lane if anyone's interested in that and then we have um a documentary blanche ames ames um it's called borderland and that will be um at the end of june in a 55 minute documentary then we'll have a question and answer at the end with the woman who wrote the documentary um, and was in on the production and all that. But for now, we have got Amelia Benstead and she is with the National Park Service, the Boston um, Division or Office of or what have you. She's going to give us a presentation on um, Boston's Women of the Underground Railroad and she is actually a colleague of Sean Quigley who was here a few weeks ago. So I'm going to hand it off to you, Amanda, um, Amelia. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat feature. We will have a question and answer period at the end. All right. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, it's great to see everyone. Um, thank you for coming out to the presentation tonight. Um, as Jean mentioned, my name is Amelia. I do work for the National Park Service in Boston. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in history from Gettysburg College. And then I recently completed a master's degree in history at Simmons University. Um, and I actually wrote my thesis on the women of Boston and their contributions to the Underground Railroad here, uh, which is of course what we're gonna talk about tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen with you. So as Jean mentioned, I do work for the National Parks of Boston. We're part of the National Park Service. Uh, we actually have three national parks here in Boston. Um, we have the Boston Harbor Islands, which is represented by that photo on the right-hand side of your screen. That's 34 islands and peninsulas in Boston Harbor. And we have a variety of cultural, natural, and historical resources there. Uh, on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see represented Boston African American National Historic Site. And that's a site that really delves into the history of slavery and abolition here in 19th century Boston. That also has the Black Heritage Trail. And then that photo in the center represents our third national park here in Boston, that is Boston National Historical Park. And that preserves kind of the history of the path to the American Revolution in Boston and includes the Freedom Trail. Um, so today we're going to be focusing primarily on the history of slavery and abolition in Boston. We're going to be talking about the women who lived in Boston between 1830 and 1860 and the variety of different ways that they contributed to the Underground Railroad here. So just to get us started, traditionally we define the Underground Railroad as a network of safe houses and people that leads out of enslavement in the South up to freedom in the North. And if you look at this map here, those arrows are all representing different uh, paths that people escaping enslavement would have followed. So you can see that kind of mass movement out of the Southern United States and up to the North and even up to Canada. Now, traditionally, historians have tended to gender the network um, as very white and male. Um, and we know that this is not completely accurate. We know that 
the Underground Railroad was actually supported by a diverse group of men and women and a really complex network of individuals, organizations, homes, fundraising, and events. Um, so while historians in the past have often defined a contribution to the Underground Railroad specifically as work with a safe house or with a freedom seeker, a freedom seeker is a person escaping from enslavement, um, I actually define a contribution to the Underground Railroad as a contribution to any portion of that network. So essentially, we can argue that a contribution to the abolitionist movement as a whole is in fact a contribution to that Underground Railroad. And when we have this broader definition of what the Underground Railroad looks like and how it's supported, that's how we start to see women fitting into this narrative more. Uh, so we can really classify the way that women are contributing into three different categories. The first is bearing witness, and that means attending major events that are related to the Underground Railroad, and then perhaps creating a written record of that event, of your impressions of that event. The second is organizing. Very straightforward, that's just establishing and joining organizations that are working to end enslavement or to aid freedom seekers on their journey to freedom. And then the third, and this is the one we're probably all most familiar with, that is aiding fugitives. Um, and this one is a lot more aligned with the traditional definition of the Underground Railroad. This means you're taking direct action to help freedom seekers, um, perhaps operating a safe house on the Underground Railroad. So what we're gonna do tonight, we're gonna look at a couple different examples from each of these categories to kind of get an idea of how women are contributing and supporting the Underground Railroad in Boston in that 30 year period from 1830 to 1860. So let's start with bearing witness um, and the example of the fugitive slave law. So on September 18th, 1850, President Millard Fillmore signed the fugitive slave law into effect. It is actually the final component of the Compromise of 1850. Um, so at this point, we have a couple of different states entering the Union. They're transitioning from territories to statehood. Uh, there's a huge debate. Are these states going to enter as free states or are they going to enter as slave states? Now, we're 11 years out from the beginning of the Civil War at this point, which means that we have a really precarious balance of slave states versus free states. Um, the North, full of predominantly free states, they don't want to have another slave state enter because then they can be outvoted by those slave states. Same thing for the South. They don't want another free state to enter because then they're going to kind of lose their power and they can be outvoted. So there's not a ton of room for compromise at this point, um, but there's just enough that we get the Compromise of 1850, which includes that fugitive slave law. So prior to the passage of the fugitive slave law, if you were an enslaved person, and you escaped from the person who was enslaving you up north into a free state, you were technically a free person. Your enslaver did not have a legal federal right to recapture you and bring you back into slavery. It definitely did happen, but again, that is not an action that's supported by federal law. And that's what changes with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law. Um, it says that now, if you have someone who escapes from enslavement, you can send slave catchers, who are federal marshals up to the state that you think that person is residing in with a warrant for their arrest. Now these slave catchers also have the power to deputize individuals to help them recapture this escaped person. Um, and if you refuse to help, you can be fined $1,000, which is about $28,000 today, and put in jail for six months. Um, if you are captured as a fugitive enslaved person, you're placed on trial. However, at that trial, you're not allowed to speak in your defense, and the judge is paid $5 to declare you a free person and $10 to declare you enslaved. So there's a built-in bribery system here. Now, the passage of the Federal Fugitive Slave Law ends up being this galvanizing moment for people across the United States, and that includes women. Um, a lot of people before the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law don't have a personal opinion on slavery, it might not affect them directly. They don't think it's their business. And this really changes that. And we see reactions, not just from Bostonians, but from the entire country. And we see reactions from women getting involved. Um, so this is actually an excerpt from the diary of Caroline Dahl, who is a Bostonian woman. Um, and on October 14, 1850, Caroline Dahl actually felt really sick. She was supposed to go up to Lynn that day to visit one of her friends. Um, but as you can see in this excerpt here, 
She's unable to go because she feels so sick. However, on October 14, 1850, there was also a rally at Faneuil Hall to discuss this fugitive slave law and what the best course of action against it was. Uh, so as the excerpt reads, Caroline Dahl wrote, I could not resist going to the meeting at Faneuil Hall in the evening. It was a grand meeting. There was but one feeling among the 6,000 persons assembled there, and that was to trample this law underfoot. There was no bluster in the matter, but may God bless Douglas, Phillips, and Parker for the noble words they spoke that night. Um, so I think this is a really powerful statement because Caroline Dahl, she's not feeling well this day, right? She cancels plans she has to travel because she's feeling so sick, yet she feels so strongly about the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law and the importance of attending this meeting that she drags herself to that meeting in the evening. And not only that, after she comes home from the meeting, a couple of days later, you can see that this journal entry is from October 20th, 1850. A couple of days later, she sits down and she takes the time to reflect on that meeting and to record her thoughts and her experience on it. So again, she's creating that written record and she's bearing witness to one of those key moments of the Underground Railroad. Now, the second example of this I would like to share with you is the story of Anthony Burns. Now, Anthony Burns, uh, was actually born into enslavement in Virginia, and in 1854, early that year, he actually escapes up to Boston. Um, he gets a job in Boston, he finds a place to live, he starts kind of becoming a piece of that community. And then a couple of months later, he's arrested as a fugitive enslaved person, and he's placed on trial here in Boston. Now, Boston's abolitionist community immediately rallies around Anthony Burns and tries to find a way to gain his freedom. So they try a variety of different things. Uh, they try to break him out of the courthouse. That's something that has worked in the past with other fugitive enslaved people. They provide him with a lawyer to represent him at trial. Remember, you're not allowed to speak in your defense on trial. Uh, they also try to purchase his freedom and they're able to raise the money to purchase his freedom. But then at the last moment, his enslaver refuses to sell him. There is such militant opposition to the recapture of Anthony Burns from Boston's abolitionist community that Boston is placed under martial law by President Pierce, um, which means that there are 2,000 federal soldiers and Marines, along with a federal ship, all sent to Boston to return Anthony Burns to enslavement in Virginia. So on the day that he is convicted, he is marched down State Street, which is that drawing you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and he is placed on a federal ship to be taken back to enslavement in Virginia. Now, this is an incredibly dark day in Boston, and it's a moment where Boston really stops completely. On this day, businesses are closed. American flags are hung upside down. Someone paints a coffin black and writes the word liberty on it and drags it behind this procession. There are thousands of people who crowd the streets of Boston to watch as Anthony Burns takes that long march from the courthouse all the way down to the federal ship on Long Wharf. Now we know that women were a huge number of those who witnessed both the trial of Anthony Burns and that march back to enslavement. And many of these women actually recorded testimonials of this event in letters and journals. So I wanna share with you just a couple examples of those testimonials um, because they're really key because they create a historical written record that includes the voices of women. So the first I'd like to share with you is from a Boston woman named Martha Russell, and it reads, Did you ever feel every drop of blood in you boiling and seething, throbbing and burning, until it seemed you should suffocate? Did you ever set your teeth hard together to keep down the spirit that was urging you to do something to cool your indignation that good and wise people would call violence treason? I have felt all this today. I have seen that poor slave Anthony Burns carried back into slavery. Now, I think Russell's words really capture that incredible sense of anger and helplessness that a lot of Bostonians felt on this day. She's creating a written record, not just of the events, but she's providing a written record that gives insight into how Boston's women perceived and contributed to the triumphs and failures of that Underground Railroad in Boston. She's also creating an emotional account of this day. She's giving us insight into how women and other Bostonians felt about Anthony Burns being returned to enslavement. And from Russell's words, we can understand that women were invested not just in the case of Anthony Burns, 
but really in the larger success of the Underground Railroad. Which brings us to the second way that women are contributing, and that's through organizing. Um, now frequently, women's investment in the Underground Railroad drove them to join anti-slavery organizations. Um, however, they already, they were frequently joining pre-existing anti-slavery organizations, but they're not always allowed to because of the fact that they're women. Not all anti-slavery societies are interested in including women at this point. Remember, we're talking 1830s to 1860s. Uh, so in those cases, women often founded their own societies. And that's what you see here in front of you. These are three different examples of anti-slavery organizations that women founded throughout the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So the one in the center, this is the earliest one. This is the African American Female Intelligence Society of Boston. And this is actually a benevolent society, um, which means that they're kind of focused on uplifting themselves and those around them in their community. So they're sponsoring things like political lectures and discussions. They're providing health insurance, other forms of social welfare to their members in the 1830s. And essentially, they're providing a sphere for Black women to become more active in their communities and in a political sphere. So this is really groundbreaking in its own way. Um, to the right of that, you see the Freedom Association, and that was founded in 1842 by Black men and women. Um, it reads that the object of our association is to extend a helping hand who may bid adieu to whips and chains and by the welcome light of the North Star reach a haven where they can be protected from the grasp of the man stealer. So those are some really powerful words. They're setting out a very bold plan for what they plan to do with their society, for how they're going to help people achieve that freedom. What's also really interesting about the Freedom Association is that it has, it has run by a board of directors. And that board of directors actually includes two women. Their names are Mary L. Armstead and Judith Smith. So this shows us not only that women are participating in these organizations, but they're founding them. And then they also have a voice in the direction of these organizations. They're helping to shape the voice and the work of this entire society. And if you look to the left of your screen, you see another example, which is the Fugitives Aid Society. And this was an organization founded solely by Black women during the American Civil War. Um, it actually meets at the African Meeting House, which is on the north slope of Beacon Hill. And they collected money and clothes that was then sent to Washington, D.C. to help support those freedom seekers who were escaping slave enslavement in the South and arriving at the lines of Union soldiers in D.C. So this one's really interesting because we see these women working and networking on a national level, not just in Boston, to support the Underground Railroad. We see them really coordinating this effort. Now, one of the best examples of how effectively these women organized was the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. Um, this is truly an impressive organization, um, regardless of the fact that it is one of the first female founded organizations in Boston for the end of enslavement. Uh, it is founded in April 1834 by a really diverse group of black women, uh, sorry, black and white women. And during the 1830s, this becomes one of the nation's leading anti-slavery societies. Now, if you take a look at the Constitution, that's the image you see on the left-hand side of the screen. <clears throat> Part of it reads, believing slavery to be a direct violation of the laws of God and productive of a vast amount of misery and crime, and convinced that its abolition can only be affected by an acknowledgement of the justice and necessity of immediate emancipation, we hereby agree to form ourselves into a society to aid and assist in this righteous cause as far as lies within our power. So take a moment to think about that, that wording. These are really ambitious, lofty goals that these women are setting. They're advocating for immediate emancipation. They don't want this to happen 10 years down the road. They want it now. They're using incredibly powerful language. You know, they're writing that slavery is a direct violation of the laws of God. And in 1834, that is an incredibly powerful moral argument. Now, this constitution is really reflective of the women who are founding this organization. Um, and one of the organization's major contributions to the Underground Railroad was, in fact, fundraising. Um, women are uniquely positioned to be very effective fundraisers during this time. And one of the ways that the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society fundraised 
was through the annual Anti-Slavery Bazaar. And this was a fair that occurred every year between Christmas and New Year's, and it's selling imported goods from Europe. It actually continues long after the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society kind of dissolved. Um, so we see this is one of its legacies throughout the larger anti-slavery movement and Underground Railroad. Um, the funds that are raised by the Anti-Slavery Bazaar, they actually go to support lectures and publications for the larger American Anti-Slavery Society. So we see these women not only generating important funds, but then they're amplifying the work that they can do through a larger society by, by funneling that money to that organization. One of the other things too they do is that they directly remove a child from enslavement, which is really impressive. Um, in 1836, they hired a lawyer to successfully defend the enslaved girl, Med. Um, so in the summer of 1836, Med was six years old and she was actually enslaved to a woman named Mary Ave Slater in New Orleans. Um, now that summer, Mary Ave Slater was planning to visit her father, Thomas Aves, who lived on the south slope of Beacon Hill. So she brought Med with her to Boston. We don't know exactly why she brought Med, because she did leave Med's mother behind. So the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society pretty quickly learns that there is a young black child uh, being held as an enslaved person on the south slope of Beacon Hill. And member Lydia Maria Child actually recalled that we obtained all the evidence we wanted, carried it to a lawyer who petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus. The judge granted the petition and the man who held little Ned in custody was brought up for trial. So they have not only successfully hired and defended Ned, but they have removed this child from enslavement. Um, so we see them really affecting an immediate change on a person's life here. Some of the other things that this organization did, um, they hosted lectures with famous abolitionists. So George Thompson from Great Britain came and spoke with the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. They are prolific petitioners. Um, they're coordinating multi-state petition campaigns for abolition. And during their first year of petitioning, which actually happens to be the same year they achieved Meds Freedom, 1836, the women who are petitioning collect twice as many signatures as the men. So we see this as really a place where women are excelling. These women are not working in a vacuum. Um, although they're not always welcome in larger male anti-slavery societies, they are actively seeking out allies to work with and to collaborate with. Um, and they're doing anything they can to magnify their impact on the larger success of the Underground Railroad. So this brings us to our third way of contributing, and that's directly aiding fugitives. Um, and I think Harriet Hayden is a really great example of this. Um, in many cases, women are going to take more direct action to help um, freedom seekers, and Harriet Hayden is the perfect example of how they're going to do this. So Harriet was born into enslavement in Kentucky around 1816. Um, while she's enslaved, she marries her husband, Lewis, who was also enslaved. Um, and in 1844, they decide that they want to try their luck on the Underground Railroad. So they escape up north. They go first to Detroit and to Canada. And then both Harriet and Lewis feel very strongly that they want to come back to Boston and actively contribute to the success of the Underground Railroad. So they move back to Boston and they move into this house. That's the image on the right hand side of your screen, 66 Phillip Street on the North Slope of Beacon Hill. So they're moving into the heart of the free black abolitionist community that exists here in Boston. Now, almost as soon as they move into this home, Harriet and her husband become a critical piece of the Underground Railroad. They open their house up as a safe house. Um, and this safe house used to be referred to as the Temple of Refuge, and it was known as the safest safe house on the Underground Railroad. So think about how many safe houses exist throughout the South, the North, the entire Underground Railroad. And yet it is Harriet and Lewis Hayden's home that ends up being the safest safe house on that entire network. That is an incredible achievement. Um, if we look at the plaque in the middle, the plaque actually only commemorates Lewis Hayden. This is the plaque that marks the side of their home um, and it acknowledges Lewis Hayden's achievements. However, it does not mention Harriet. And this is really unfortunate because Harriet is the woman doing most of the work to operate this home as a safe house. 
Because Lewis is a man, he enjoys an elevated status in society. He's working more outside the home. He's networking with other abolitionists in the community. He's kind of the public face of their home. Harriet, however, is doing all of the heavy lifting for this house. Um, she is providing food, clothing, a place to sleep, information, and she's essentially running this home as a boarding house for freedom seekers. So when those freedom seekers come to Boston looking for direction, looking for a place of refuge, it's Harriet who's taking them in, who's orienting them to the city and helping them get acclimated as best she can. Um, most records do not credit Harriet for her work. Uh, most records are very similar to the plaque that we see on the outside of the Hayden House. However, historians lately have started to kind of reevaluate how women are supporting the Underground Railroad and how their work is commemorated. Um, and Stephen Kantrowitz, who wrote a fantastic book all about this community, has a great quote where he says that only one name entered the records of the city's lawyers and bookkeepers, but the couple's labors were complementary and mutually necessary. Um, after Lewis Hayden passes away, Harriet actually donates money to Harvard Medical School to establish a scholarship for Black students. Um, and that is a scholarship that still exists today. So we see Harriet's legacy continuing not just through her continued work with the Underground Railroad, but into the 1900s and the 2000s. Um, another great example of women directly aiding fugitives comes from the story of Jane Johnson. So Jane Johnson was born into enslavement, very similar to Harriet. Uh, and we know that in 1855, she was actually enslaved to a man named John Hill Wheeler in North Carolina. And at that time, she also had two sons who were under the age of 12. We don't know when Jane was born, uh, but in 1855, she believes that she was about 25 years old. Uh, so Jane was not only enslaved, but she was also a very young mother. Now, the other thing that happens in 1855 is that her enslaver, John Hill Wheeler, he is appointed US minister to Nicaragua. Uh, so this means that he's going to move to Nicaragua to take this job. And when he decides to move there, he wants to bring Jane and her sons with him. Um, so on his way to Nicaragua, because he's traveling from North Carolina, he actually goes up to Philadelphia, which is located in the free state of Pennsylvania. And in Philadelphia, Wheeler leaves Jane Johnson and her sons on the boat that's going to take them south while he goes to a hotel to have dinner. Now at that time, as soon as kind of Wheeler is out of the picture, Johnson looks around, she notices two people that she identifies as colored people. She looks at them and she tells them that she wants to escape and become a free person. They really don't give any indication to Johnson that they have heard her, they just kind of walk away. However, what they do is they immediately go and notify William Still of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. Now Still and a man named Passmore Williamson come to the rescue of Jane Johnson and her sons. They go down to the ship where Johnson is waiting with her children. And Johnson actually on trial described this moment. And she said of Williamson, he held out his hand but did not touch mine. And I immediately arose to go with him. I took my oldest boy by the hand the youngest was picked up by some people and became very much alarmed. Then I proceeded off the boat as quickly as I could, being perfectly willing and desirous to go. And with that, Jane Johnson becomes a free woman. So following her escape from her enslaver in Philadelphia with the help of the free black community there, Johnson actually travels up to Boston as a free woman where she very quickly becomes an integral part of that community. So these images are from the, the account book of the Boston Vigilance Committee. Uh, the Boston Vigilance Committee was an organization of Bostonians who were dedicated to helping free enslaved people uh, and kind of deterring slave catchers from carrying out their work in Boston. So they're an incredibly essential group of people to that free black community and to anyone who's seeking refuge in Boston from enslavement. Now, this record book is really interesting because it inclu includes all money that is moved in Boston to deal with the Underground Railroad. So this is actually a very dangerous record for them to have kept because had it fallen into the wrong hands, they would have been able to identify many of the people who are working closely with the Underground Railroad in Boston. So it's kind of shocking that we have this record in the first place. What's really cool about it, though, is that Jane Johnson's name appears three times just over these two pages. If you look at the top entry on the left, it reads 
November 10, 1855, William Mannix for board of Jane Johnson and two children, shoes and other expenses. So that entry is recognizing Jane Johnson staying in Boston with her sons after gaining her freedom in Philadelphia, but she's there before she's had a chance to really integrate into the community and find her own place to live. Just a couple months later, however, Jane Johnson has transitioned from a freedom seeker to a community member who is helping other people to escape from enslavement. So if you look at that second entry on the left-hand side, it dated, it's dated January 30th, 1856, and it says Mrs. J. Johnson boarding blank Brown, we don't know what their first name was, and then she's reimbursed the amount of $13.50. So Johnson immediately became an active member of the abolitionist community here in Boston, um, and this is not just a one-off event. This is something that she is consistently doing over the years. So if you look at that second page, that's from 1859. A couple years prior to that, Jane Johnson actually remarries. She marries a man named Lawrence Woodfolk, and then she takes his last name. So she goes from being Jane Johnson to Jane Woodfolk. And we see down the bottom of that page, it reads for April 13th, 1859, Jane Woodfolk for boarding George Thompson and Henry Wilson from Richmond, Virginia. And then again, the amount she's reimbursed. So a couple years later, um, Jane Johnson is still living her new life in Boston, she's remarried, and she is still helping people to escape from enslavement. Um, now, as her own survivor of escape and enslavement, Jane Johnson is repeatedly risking her own freedom and security in the hopes that she can change the lives of others by extending that helping hand to those who are escaping from enslavement. Now, within the account book of the Boston Vigilance Committee, Jane Johnson does not stand alone. There are actually over 20 women who are recorded in this record for their work with the Underground Railroad over the course of the 11 years that it spans. So here's a couple more excerpts from the account book of the Boston Vigilance Committee. Um, on these three pages, nine different women appear for their work with the Underground Railroad. And their names are Isabella Holmes, Clara Vaught, Mary Keogh, Margaret Irwin, Sarah A. Taylor, Adeline Skeen, Cornelia Atkins, Jane Woodfolk, who we know, and Elizabeth Gilmore. So just from these three pages, we're able to get a better idea of how essential to the Underground Railroad these Boston women were. They are risking their own safety and their own freedom over and over again in a courageous effort to extend help to freedom seekers across the country, not just in Boston. And they really do stand as the embodiment of what an activist can and should be. So this is the final image I'd like to share with you. This is a list of women's known contributions to the Underground Railroad in Boston. This is not by any means an exhaustive list. It is constantly evolving as we find new evidence about how these women were involved with the Underground Railroad. But you notice that it is really substantial. So on it, you're seeing the names of women, their organizations, the events they witnessed as they actively contributed to the Underground Railroad between 1830 and 1860. And you're seeing the names of every single woman that we know to this date has done that. So it's critical that historians continue to seek out these daring women and reframe the Underground Railroad as that national network created and supported by a diverse group of men and women. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I know you do. And I'm going to ask you to unmute yourselves. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> How did Harriet uh, and Lewis Hayden made their uh, income? It seems to me they were doing very well by accommodating and living in a nice place. So how did what, what was their profession? Yeah, so you've actually touched upon a couple of different things. Um, Lewis Hayden owned a used clothing store, which does not sound like an incredibly lucrative career at that point and would have been a very middle class income. Um, we know that today Beacon Hill is a very expensive, nice place to live. However, in the 1800s, it was not. Um, the south slope of Beacon Hill, which is the side that faces Boston Common, has always been a really expensive side of the hill to live on. However, that free black community is living on the north slope of Beacon Hill 
And that's the side that abuts the Charles River. The Charles River actually comes up higher in the 1800s than it does today because a lot of Boston has been filled in. Right. Uh, back then it smells terrible as well. It's really polluted from rope making. Um, there are rope walks on that side of the hill. So the area that Lewis and Harriet Hayden are living in is actually not a desirable area of Boston to live in. It's where you can find some of the cheapest housing. Um, so while their home is worth a significant amount of money today, um, back in the 1800s, it would have been a pretty modest home to live in. But still they had to accommodate all these fugitive and uh, uh, pay for their food, accommodation, all that. What Did that come from the society, the broader society? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, that account book from the Boston Vigilance Committee is tracking funds that are sent to people as they're helping board people in their homes. Um, things like buying tickets for them on ships or trains to move on, um, being reimbursed for food, clothing. Um, we know people were reimbursed about $2.50 a week for boarding someone in their home. So this is very much an initiative that is supported by the entire community because you're right, um, for just Lewis and Harriet, it would have been really prohibitive to try and support all of these freedom seekers on their own. So that money is coming from the Haydens, but also from that larger community, from all of that fundraising. It's coming through the Boston Vigilance Committee, and then it's being kind of systematically reimbursed to them and others. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Well, no, other than the question that I did have related to the same thing around how they paid for sheltering, supporting, and maintaining people who were, became successful fugitives anyway. And I think she answered the question well. Um, is there any sort of measure that you can give us that would, you know, a comparison or whatever, given charities today versus then, and was it a real struggle for the people who were involved, both being sheltered and caring for the sheltered? Yeah, that's really tough to quantify. Um, we, we don't have complete records of the Underground Railroad. It is a really tricky area of history to research because it's secretive. Um, so the fact that we have an account book like the Boston Vigilance Committee is pretty shocking and unusual. Mm -hmm. um, however, we saw that, you know, the societies you saw are really just a smattering of the organizations that existed in Boston. There are so many anti-slavery organizations that exist, not just in Boston, but throughout Massachusetts and the Northern United States. And they're really well coordinated. So the money that is going to support people like Lewis and Harriet Hayden um, or any of those other women who operated safe houses, it's not coming just from that Boston community. There's donations coming in from other towns in Massachusetts, from New England. So all of that money is being funneled to kind of these hubs of the abolitionist movement from other organizations and communities throughout the Northern United States. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much that money would be worth today, um, I can't give you a great example um, but the conversion for 1850 to 2020 is about a factor of 28. So if you're looking at moving $1,000 of funds in 1850, that's about $28,000 today. So they are moving significant amounts of money. I just can't give you one good number, unfortunately. I see that most of the action is in the uh, eastern part of the United States. And there seems to be one line of uh, Underground Railroad on the West Coast uh, with not much support. Yeah, so the Eastern United States is definitely kind of more of a hub of the Underground Railroad. Um, and there's, there's several reasons for that. You know, we have most of our population concentrated in the Eastern half of the US at that point. Um, a lot of people who are escaping up north from further in the south, they're also doing so aboard ships. We know that a lot of people who arrived in Boston from enslavement actually did so by stowing away on ships leaving the Carolinas, Virginia, and coming up to Boston, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, to Philadelphia. So 
there's that. Um, when you look at kind of industry and the economy, when you get out to the Western United States, it's less based on money and often more on bartering. Um, so that's why we see more of those funds kind of coming from the Eastern half of the country versus the West. But across the board, we see really consistent routes of escape from the South up to the North or to Canada. It seems it'd be much harder going up the Western side because you don't have much support at all. Looks it like it's all by ocean. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends. Um, I, each area really presents its own challenges. So when you get further out into the West, there's less people. So you have more of an ability to kind of hide in the wilderness and disguise yourself that way. Whereas in the East, you're more happening upon people's homes and, and their goodwill. Now, once, once they made it here, do they have to be stay in hiding or they could go out and find work? How was their life? It's a great question. Um, I, each, each person's life was vastly different from than others. Um, some people get to Boston or they get to maybe New York, Albany, Philadelphia, and they feel that they are far enough removed from enslavement that they are safe in that location. These are all kind of hubs of abolitionism and free black communities, which means that it's relatively easy for these people to kind of lose themselves within that community. A lot of people, however, don't feel safe with that. Um, we talked about how after 1850, that fugitive slave law is in place, which means that they can legally be recaptured and brought back into slavery in the South. And we know sure. that happens many times. So a lot of people do choose to move on to Canada um, or even further yeah. north. Yeah, much more difficult to get them. Yeah, once you cross the federal boundary, you're really home safe. I, I have another question. Um, and this is a sort of sidebar question, if you will. As somebody who has researched and written for a long time about local slavery, um, I'm really curious about how you found out about this, how you got so interested that we're now able to hear about it. And I have to tell you, this is mind blowing because it's a brand new thing for me relative to the incredibly expansive slave history that is all part of our lives. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for asking. I love this question, actually. Um, when I was in grad school, I had to, there was a term paper I had to write that I initially thought I was going to write about, I think it was Lucy Stone and her impact on the abolition movement. And my mm -hmm. professor came back to me and she was like, no, 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 that's been done. Do something <laughs> different. Um, so I was talking to a couple of my colleagues at work at Boston African American kind of trying to figure out what I could do. And one of them said, well, what if you started to focus on the women? Because um, two years ago, we had kind of a handful of names of women that we knew had had some involvement, but we weren't really sure of the extent, you know, we knew of Harriet Hayden, we'd heard about Isabella Holmes, um, but there was a lot we didn't know. Uh, so initially I wasn't sure I could even find the 25 pages I was gonna need for that term paper. Um, but then I started sifting through records like the Vigilance Committee's account book and really looking for those women's names. Um, I started going through things like Ancestry.com, newspaper archives, genealogy bank, um, and from there piecing together a little bit of who these women were. And then really looking at those organizations and accounts women had written about different anti-slavery events they'd attended. Um, and it's funny because they're kind of hiding in plain sight. We just haven't, um, we haven't thought to look for them as much. And the way we do history has shifted a lot in the last 10 or 15 years to be a more inclusive and dynamic approach, which is great for these women. Um, but in general, they're, they're tricky to find, right? No one is focused on recording women in the 1800s because they are subsumed in a legal sense under husbands and fathers. Uh, so a lot of the women are kind of lost forever in a sense. They just are not in those historic records. So for every woman we do find and understand what she's contributed, there are many more that just there truly is no record. Wow. Terrific. Right on. <laughs> the good work. <laughs> 
So Amelia, I have a quick question. Um, so growing up, I had an aunt who lived in um, Abington and her house was built in the early 1700s. And she told us that they were told that their home was part of the Underground Railroad. I find it, now then I didn't really understand it all. Now, I find it sort of hard to understand that so far from a hub like Boston, I mean, that's probably 30 miles, that that would actually be used. Did you find that or was that common? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is tricky to kind of pinpoint where Underground Railroad houses existed because they're supposed to be a secret. Um, but we see a huge concentration of them in hubs like Boston, Albany, Philadelphia, and New York. Um, but then we also see them very consistently between those places. Um, so, you know, if someone's final destination is Canada or is Albany, there's a lot of small towns that have to work their way through to get there. So those underground railroad sites really do kind of pepper the countryside just as much as they do the cities. Um, it's definitely... I think safer in a city because you have a larger quantity of people and you have more diverse people. So in a place like Abington, um, if you have escaped from enslavement, you're probably going to stick out like a sore thumb because there's not a wealth of diverse people in that town. Um, but absolutely, they're, they're across the nation. They're in smaller towns. They're in larger cities. Um, you know, the routes people took to freedom are really as numerous as the people who escaped. The 16th and 17th. Uh, there's been a black community yes, for a long, long time on the vineyard. Yes. What, do you, what do you know about the origin? Did they come on the boat or they were also part of the fugitive movement? Um, so I know less about the community on the vineyard. That's a little out of my area of expertise. Um, but from what I've read, they come from both. Um, Martha's Vineyard also has a really rich maritime history and one of the places that Black Americans often found employment in the 19th century was in the maritime world. So um, a place like Martha's Vineyard where there are so many ships that you can work on and be a part of, that's going to draw that Black community because those are jobs that are traditionally accepted for them to have. All right, so I just wanted to kind of follow up on what Jean was saying actually about the house in Abington. So we lived in a house in Connecticut in a, a tiny rural farming town, Durham, not near, I mean, it was between, between Hartford and New Haven. I mean, it was like in the middle of nowhere. And our house was built in the 1700s and was absolutely known to be part of the Underground Railroad. And we had hiding places, both like hidden attic spaces, as well as in the basement, there was a big tunnel. So if someone was coming, you could go through this tunnel and it would put you out in the woods behind the house. Um, and it was all, that was all blocked in since then because who wants a big tunnel in the back of their house? But um, the history and the research that we had from that house when we moved in was that it was like a stop along the way to get you to where you need to go. And like you said, I'm sure it was more dangerous because you were in the rurals, but you had to get from city to city so that they were a key part um, and that most of the community actually was aware, even though unofficially, right, that that was, that, that was what they were doing there and helped and supported um, the people in the house who were that safe house. So. It, it, it seems strange, Jean, I'm with you, like, that. oh, but you're not in a, a place that they would want to get to, but they got to get there, right? So <laughs> they need those stops along the way as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I'd love to see that house. That's so cool. It was a beautiful house. <laughs> <laughs> have another. Oh, sorry. <laughs> He put on various drones all the time. Ruth, did you have a question? I do. I, sorry, I. I get okay, go ahead. Talking. Um, I'm, I'm curious about women alone. Um, did they go on their own? Were they always part of a group when they were in Boston, for instance? Were 
they married? Were they part of a family um, during that time? And this whole situation was being a single woman a particular um, difficulty. Yes, I would say that during the 19th century, being a single woman was generally difficult. Um, the world is not set up for a single woman in that time period. Um, there's a lot of kind of societal norms that are constrictive to women at that point. So that was definitely challenging. Um, when we look at kind of the known statistics for who is escaping on the Underground Railroad, um, we do generally see more men escaping than women. A um, couple reasons for that. So women are traditionally cast in the mother role. Um, women in enslavement are often pregnant many times and very young and are reluctant to escape without their children. Um, mm -hmm. Men, on the other hand, they're slightly less tethered to their children. People are traded often and sold. So frequently they're separated and are not necessarily aware of the children they do have. So we do see a higher percentage of men escaping than women. Women also are escaping regularly on the Underground Railroad. Often they try to do so more as a group or with their children. Um, and for that reason, they're caught more frequently. Um, you know, the logistics of escaping with children is really challenging. This is grueling. You're walking for miles and miles and miles for days and weeks on end. You're stowing away on ships. These are really t challenging conditions for anyone, much less for small children. Um, and then when they get to a free state, um, it really depends. We saw that Jean Johnson lived in Boston for a couple of years as a single woman with two children, and she was able to support herself there. Um, we're not sure exactly how she supported herself. She probably relied at least in part on the support of the community around her for things like childcare while she was out working. Um, but then she does remarry. Um, and that's actually not the only time Jane Johnson remarries. She actually, her husband, Lawrence Woodfolk, he does die and she remarries after that again. So I think she's kind of a good example of how women often leaned into marriage as a way to kind of support themselves and to make themselves, make their lives a little easier. Because it is really challenging to navigate as a woman at that point, particularly when you have children depending upon you. But it could be done. Um, and these women are so dedicated to giving back to others and trying to kind of repay what someone did for them to help them achieve their freedom, which we see throughout the account book and other accounts from women. In that time in history, women were second-class citizens. Uh, they, uh, in most cases, they couldn't own land. Uh, they couldn't uh, buy land and uh, they uh, could not really uh, support themselves very well uh, in the, uh, world. And so the only way to uh, survive was to marry. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely accurate that women are second class citizens. And then if you couple that with being a black American woman at that point, I mean, <laughs> the challenge is many fold, uh, which is why things like those benevolent societies like the African American Female Intelligence Society become so important because that is a forum for these women to really feel empowered and to better themselves and receive that support from the community. Well, now we can vote, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what good it does sometimes, but <laughs> now they have the vote. <laughs> yeah, and what's interesting, too, is that a lot of these women that we see working with the abolitionist movement, they're also really invested in the suffragist movement. Um, it's a very natural transition for them to shift from one forum of empowerment to another. So that's a really cool thread to kind of follow through that 150 years or so. They were outstanding black women in the suffragist movement. They were amazing, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately, similarly to the women, the black women of the Underground Railroad, the black women of the suffrage movement don't get as much attention as they should. Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. And a lot of women today are more educated than men and make better salaries. <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> We're moving up. Hooray. <laughs> Can I ask a question? In, in terms of, have you had any contact with any of the family members of the women that you've researched? 
a great question. Not yet. Um, it, it took me about a year and a half, two years to get to this point and, and to find this much information. Um, right now, I think my focus is most on kind of trying to broaden the amount and the scope of women we include. Um, and after I get a larger picture of it, I would like to try and trace a couple of these women who have um, a more promising looking kind of profile in places like historical newspapers and genealogy banks um, and see if I could find some of their descendants. Um, but occasionally at the at Boston African American National Historic Site, we do have descendants um, of freedom seekers visit the site. And a couple years ago, we had, I think the great great granddaughter of Ellen Craft visit, which was really incredible because Ellen Craft and her husband William escaped from Georgia. Um, and then they moved to Boston for a while. Um, they moved to Liverpool. They published their narrative on how they escaped called Running a Thousand Miles to Freedom. They raised a family over there. And then following the end of the Civil War, they moved back to Georgia and opened a school for black children. So we did have their descendant come, which is really neat. Um, so I do hope that one day I can trace a couple of these women and get to meet their families. But we'll see because they really they're hard to, to find in historical records. Is it possible because I'm not, our brother does history, family history, but we're not on stuff. Is it possible through Ancestry to put out there that this information is available so maybe more people would contact you? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Um, genealogical history is not my specialty. I, I have colleagues that are much better at it than I am. Um, I think that's definitely possible. I think with the park service, there's a lot of kind of specific ways you have to do things and red tape you have to be cautious of. Um, but we, we're in the process of trying to make these women a little more visible in our programming, um, on the thing, the articles, videos we have on our website um, through social media. So there's always the hope that maybe in the meantime, they find us through there. Yeah. Um, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So, it, it, where is the headquarter of the Boston African American his, History National S History so Society? Yeah, so that's the north slope of Beacon Hill. Um, the Black Heritage Trail is about a one and a half mile loop that runs through there. There's no line on the ground, but there are signs. And it actually concludes at the Museum of African American History. So we have a long standing partnership with the museum. Um, and you can visit us over at the museum. We have our offices just in a regular office building at State Street. Um, and then we also work over at the Visitor Center of Samuel Hall for the Park Service. So okay. a spread out. But, but where's the museum? The museum's on Beacon Hill. It's on Joy Street. Which street? Joy Street. Oh, Joy Street. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like to meander there. <laughs> Amelia, are you the only one that would do this tour in person? Um, the women? Yeah. Yeah, so right now I'm the only one um, well-versed in the, the women in the Underground Railroad. Um, but I am working with a couple colleagues of mine, actually, to hopefully later this summer um, include a virtual tour that is both a portion of this and a portion of suffrage history in Boston um, and create a women's tour. So hopefully that's coming up in the next couple of months in a virtual format, if not in person. And will you keep me posted on that? Absolutely. You no, know, that would be great. And, you know, some of us may be interested in coming into the city at some point and maybe taking this tour with you. That's why I asked if you would be the person, you know, we would, we would have, which would be great. Yeah, I would love that. Um, things are a little complicated right now with, with COVID. We're not offering in-person programs yet, um, but please do keep in touch and we'll see what we can figure out. <laughs>